This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and let me start with a, a shout out to those who've helped provide questions that we'd be asking our statewide candidates. We've had several people, but we've especially appreciated those from the Sorensen Leadership Class of 2013. And today we welcome our statewide candidate for governor, Robert Sarvis, Libertarian candidate. We're delighted to have you here with us to talk with the viewers about why you're running and to help them in this time we have to better understand your perspective and, and Libertarian Party perspective on the issues that confront us here in Virginia. So if you would, just start by telling your, your viewers something about yourself and then let's move into the Libertarian Party and then to some issues. Sure. Uh, my name is Robert Sarvis and I'm the Libertarian candidate. I was born in Fairfax County, grew up there. Uh, I, I moved back here in 2006 raising a family uh, in Fairfax County and I, my experiences in uh, law, economics and technology sector and my educational background is a math degree from Harvard and Cambridge, uh, a law degree from NYU and an economics degree from George Mason University. I, I ran two years ago as a state, for state senate uh, as a Republican but I decided in the last couple years that the Republican Party was not very good for a good home for uh, liberty candidates and so it was kind of natural to uh, run as a libertarian this time. So uh, thank you for that background information. Uh, some of our viewers already think they have a grasp but they may not have it correctly. Uh, how would you describe Libertarian Party particularly here in Virginia? It may or may not differ in other states but how, how would you describe what are the basic principles or positions that you take? I think the, the simplest way to think of it is just a presumption that you should be free to live your life as you see fit and to run your business as you see fit as long as you're not hurting other people. Um, so that means that we support freedom in both the economic sphere and the personal sphere. And so that's why I'm presenting a vision of Virginia that's open-minded and open for business. So as, as you think about that, then let's come to some issues. Uh, one of the big issues this past legislative session here in Richmond around the state and, and maybe one of the issues going forward. What, what perspectives do you bring to bear on the transportation needs in the Commonwealth? The transportation bill, well the transportation needs are unarguable and so if we're going to meet those needs we need to do it in an intelligent manner, a rational economic ma manner that is fair to taxpayers and uh, meets the challenges that we're going to face over the next generation. So what I, what I did not like to see in the transportation bill was a continuation of the centralized bureaucratic decision making, which is very opaque. I think that we should uh, give local jurisdictions more power and the, funding, and the funding to go with it. Money should stay where it's raised. 
and decisions should be made more by people who are closer to the people, more accountable to the people, and have the local knowledge about the relative merits of various projects. So I didn't like that it, it maintained the, the state centralization. I also didn't like that it moved us away from a, a away from the ideal of user pays uh, towards a general sales tax funding. I think that was regressive, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, you really need to have some sort of, of nexus between the, the fundraising and the usage of the infrastructure. I also thought that uh, the, the, the set, the fixed tax, the fixed fee on, on electro electrical vehicles uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, at least how it was done. And I don't think that 140 legislators know the exact percentage that's going to be most efficient in terms of uh, funding mass transit. So I think that that was also kind of a strange thing to see in a piece of legislation. Uh, I think that we should have moved more towards decentralized decision making, uh, closer to user, user pays, and kind of you know, get a lot of bureaucrats out of the decision making process. And you see that with a lot of projects around the state where there's a real, uh, a real fight uh, and, and, and a lot of people asking why is Richmond making this decision for us. You know, if, if I stick for just a moment with the idea of decentralized, probably if we had any kind of accurate poll of current legislators in Virginia, and even of, of candidates like yourself, other mm -hmm. statewide candidates, most would say probably things should be decentralized. But then in Virginia, when it comes to this Dillon rule, we find that most of the folks that are elected protect the Dillon rule, and probably our, hopefully our viewers know what the Dillon rule is, that it means that local governments really only get permission, it's kind of a mother may I kind of mm -hmm. game, to, to do what the General Assembly gives them permission to do. Do you have any thoughts on, on that, whether you would say support that Dillon rule control that the state has over localities, or should the localities even have more freedoms than they do? I think it's, a, I th I'm open-minded on, the, on the, the issue. I think that whether you get rid of the Dillon, Dillon rule or within the Dillon rule, you, you actually grant the powers that are needed by local jurisdictions. You know, it can be done either way. The, the most important thing, though, is to actually do it so that local jurisdictions are able to make the decisions that they need to make. But there is a role, of course, for state oversight in terms of uh, individual rights and making sure that local governments don't get captured by special interests. You know, it, it's, um, to dig down even a little bit deeper in that, it's kind of an intriguing and interesting, and probably some viewers and, and some of us have a hard time understanding that, that cities and towns can have a tobacco tax, for instance. Counties cannot, unless they have special permission. A couple of counties have that permission. So, so again, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge as more and more counties become really urbanized and are almost like cities, but still have, uh, have less, less taxing, less ability to spread taxes over, over a variety of ways rather than just property tax and that sort of tax. So it's, it's a challenge. Right. Although I think that that, that, that can run into problems when there's a, a lot of different taxing authorities. There's a lot of ways in which uh, local, state, and federal jurisdictions all kind of hide taxes. And I think that, that a very broad-based, low-rate uh, revenue-raising taxes uh, should be the way to go as opposed to sort of you know, trying to, you know, business taxes that create a drag on economic activity, uh, sin taxes. I don't think that that's the best way to fund uh, government at any level. And I think that it creates a lot of uh, volatility in the revenue stream, which can be very problematic for uh, local governments especially. So uh, let, let's, let's stay with that a bit too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's helpful. Um, does the Libertarian Party, or again you as candidate, have a, a platform or position you would say own taxes um, beyond what you just said? Would, would, how, how, if you could wave the magic wand and change the way we're taxed in Virginia, what would it look like? Well, I think one thing to, to realize is, is irrespective of, of what tax we choose, whatever tax we choose should be done in an equitable manner, meaning that we should have the rule of law. We shouldn't have tax-exempt status for certain industries or corporations or special deductions. We should have as few of those as possible. Um, and, and so essentially, uh, that, that allows a broader base, lower rates, less drag on economic activity. Uh, generally speaking, libertarians do prefer 
uh, getting rid of the income tax, we generally view that as being a poor way of, of raising money and uh, Generally speaking, I think a lot of economists would agree that consumption taxes are a better way. Uh, we here in Virginia, though, we have a sales tax, but that only applies to goods, doesn't apply to services. It doesn't apply to a lot of uh, different industries that would otherwise get, get taxed under that system. And so you can raise more money at lower rates if you broaden the base, and you can shift a lot of the revenue raising from the income tax to the sales tax. The income tax uh, creates a drag on employment. And so that's one of the things that you can actually get a boost to employment by removing that, um, that gap between what an employer pays to employ somebody and what the employee takes home. You know, in, in looking at the House of Delegate races, that's not your race, you're, you're running for governor, but House of Delegate races, I believe I counted at least a half a dozen folks who are, who are running as libertarians. That's right. Um, it's, it's interesting if anyone looks at those because some are running against a Republican. That's right. Some are running against a Democrat. Some are running against a Democrat and a Republican. So uh, uh, is there any kind of uh, a unified message that the half dozen or so of them would have and that you would have on these issues? Absolutely. I think that, as I said in the beginning, we really care about freedom. We think that the rule of law and freedom are the principal values that we must protect in a, in a free society, in, a political, in our political system, especially in Virginia that has such a, a history with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, et cetera. But it's really important to focus on freedom across the board. That means economic freedom and personal liberty. And so we actually have to make sure that we're, we're principled in who we vote for, somebody who is not clothing themselves in the rhetoric of liberty, but then trying to foist their ideologies upon the rest of us. Thinking about those House of Delegate races or the, the Senate race that you were in two years ago, uh, our viewers and hopefully lots of other Virginians too have questions about redistricting right. and about how districts are, are drawn, um, predominantly drawn to protect incumbents, right. as most would see it. Do, do you and the uh, other libertarian candidates have perspectives on, again, what, what would we what would redistricting look like the next time it's done in Virginia if libertarians had had their way in it? Well, I can't, I can't speak to what the other libertarian candidates believe, but I certainly would expect that they would agree with me that the partisanship is poisonous when it comes to districting, especially with the technologies we have today. I think that if I, if I were to design a system, I would like for it to be uh, apolitical, and nonpartisan, ideally done by computer algorithm. There's no reason why we can't have something like that done, where you, if there are certain interests that need to be, um, that need to be protected, like compactness or, or something like that, con contiguity, you know, you can put that into the algorithm. But those are the kind of things that we should argue about, those meta rules, uh, ex ante, and, and, worry, and, and not so much kind of try to gerrymander in order for a specific result. You know, most most uh, candidates and probably most elected officials speak of trying to right-size government, try to make it more, run more efficiently, cut where things could be cut. As as you've looked at government here in Virginia, do you have any any specifics that you think that should be trimmed, cut, or disposed of completely? Certainly. Well, I I think that the the major ticket items can be done in a wholly different manner to get better outcomes at lower costs. I'm speaking specifically of the education and health care spending that we do, but also uh, things as, as small as the, uh, and I shouldn't say small, but, but the opportunity fund and the, and the money that's available for discretionary spending, I think that that creates the, an environment for some of the gift scandals that we're seeing, uh, when the, especially when the governor's expected to go around talking up Virginia businesses. I really think that that's a problem. It's, I think it's a waste of taxpayer money. It's very easy for a politician to claim that they brought jobs to Virginia, but what, what we should really be doing is attracting those jobs with an open and competitive marketplace that operates under the rule of law and rewards value creation. That's what's going to, if we get rid of a lot of the protectionist regulations that protects, um, protects market incumbents and private profits, I think that we can actually have that open and competitive marketplace, which will be more, much more flexible 
in moving people from industries that are failing to industries that are rising, and we can get people back to work and have a much more flexible and open economy. You know, switching over to another topic, uh, city of Detroit, often known for automobiles and then perhaps the lions or the tigers, but more recently known as the city gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not at all suggesting that there are cities in Virginia or local governments that are teetering on that same precipice, but what about the issue that some raised about the underfunded mandates that are there, particularly pertaining to pensions and right. other matters? Um, even at the state level, the Commonwealth's putting money back into the pension fund, trying to, to bolster it. What's, what's your perspective on that issue? I, I, it's, it's something I have strong feelings about, and I think that I'm actually the only candidate for governor who's actually talking about this and bringing it up voluntarily. Uh, it's, I, I do think that we need to properly fund it and take care of the promises that we've made. I do think that we need to follow through on the promises, but I also don't think that we should be making promises that put taxpayers in the position of being of of, man, of being sort of the underwriters of major market risk and investment risk, I think that it, that's something that uh, going forward we should move to a to a uh, defined contribution system so that so that you know we're we're rewarding the people according to you know market wages uh, and market compensation, but we're not uh, leaving this open-ended investment risk that taxpayers have to. Uh, potentially bail out in the end. You know, one of the topics, and you somewhat touched on it briefly as you were speaking, but that's certainly high visibility now is, is ethics in government. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what changes, if any, do you see that ought to be made in, in law that would help to promote greater ethics in, in government? Right. I think that there's a very strong movement right now for a gift ban, and I would support that. But I think it goes further than that. I think that the most important thing we can do to protect against corruption or even the appearance of corruption is to return to government under the rule of law, limited government under the rule of law, where we're not in the business of creating regulations that protect industries or, or, or the incumbents in industries, where we're not giving special tax treatment to particular industries or land uses or you know, particular groups of people. If we did that, there would be a lot, a lot less money spent on lobbying. Lobbying is a, is a major waste, mm -hmm. trying to get special treatment. But we'd also see a lot less ethical issues where people are trying to get favorable treatment by treating their legislators or their governors or even the bureaucrats, um, you know, especially as well. What about Medicaid expansion? Should, uh, should Virginia join other states uh, who are accepting the Medicaid expansion, or should we continue to, to, to not accept it? I think that the, the real problem with our health care system is a lot of the federal regulations and state regulations, which I'd ha be happy to talk about, but a lot of the federal re regulations have messed up the, the health care market. And one of the things we need to do is get more state policy freedom, get the federal government out of the business of, of regulating a sixth of the economy like that, and it's very centralized and it's very vast, the regulatory network. Uh, you know, get, get policy freedom at the state level so that we can actually compose our own health care policy. And that includes taking care of some of the issues. You know, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot with some of the ways that we regulate the, the health care market. So returning to a more open and competitive marketplace in health care services uh, that will reward innovation and cost reductions. And with regard to the Medicaid specifically, I certainly would not want to see us expand the program as currently as, it, as is currently um, constituted. I would like to see a system in which uh, it's converted to a block grant program where we have some sort of state policy freedom, as I mentioned, and so that we can construct a program that is much more market-based, much more market-oriented, uh, and that can lead to the cost savings and, and innovations that we're seeking. Right now, a lot of people in arguing for the, the Medicaid expansion are citing numbers that have no basis. Uh, you know, there's a lot about the, the ACA that has proven untrue. And so how can, we, how can we base our determinations of whether to expand the Medicaid program on further assertions about what will happen under, under the Act? 
the current governor has really expanded what his predecessors had done in, in restoring voting rights mm -hmm. to nonviolent felons. Um, is that something you think should be continued? Should it be expanded? And and you have any way how you would classify a nonviolent offender? How would you? Well, I think it's. I th I certainly agree and support the the restoration of, of voting rights uh, of nonviolent, especially victimless offenders. Mm -hmm. But everybody's focusing on the on that end of the pipe. I want to focus also and especially on people going into the pipe. And one of the huge reasons for the loss of voting rights is the drug war. And when you're talking about criminalizing and giving people a criminal record uh, for simple marijuana possession, that's a huge loss. Uh, it, it, first of all, it, it takes a lot of state and local enforcement money and incarceration costs. It also takes, and this is something that a lot of people don't talk about, when you give people criminal records, they become unemployable. That's a huge loss of economic activity and value. It's, it's a, it oftentimes becomes a wasted life because it destroys a person's ability to make a, an honest living. Uh, and it oftentimes forces young men out of the family, leaving kids growing up by themselves. And the drug war is the principal cause of the loss of our civil liberties. So a lot of the things that people are concerned about with regard to uh, for, loss of Fourth Amendment rights under the NSA spying scandal and the war on terrorism, all of that stems from the war on drugs. And that was, that was the main reason that we've seen a, a scaling back of our rights. So would you then be for decriminalizing the use of marijuana? Yes, certainly. Certainly decriminalizing. I would legalize medical marijuana. And I actually believe that legalizing all, uh, le just legalizing marijuana entirely is the right course. I think that our prohibition mentality uh, is causing us to make many of the same mistakes that we made in the Prohibition era. And I think that uh, it's pretty clear a lot of the same pathologies from that era are happening here today. And, you know, when you talk about a lot of people, when they talk about gun control because they want to reduce gun violence, gun violence has been going down for two decades now, but the best way we can create further reductions is to actually rationalize our drug policy and end the drug war. Say a word too about education, both public education and then higher ed. What what changes, if any, would you see in, in how Virginia is doing well, education? Sure, I would really like to see us uh, come up with a system, a, a, a universal system of school choice, and that can include tax credits and vouchers. But I would like to see that happen so that parents who are in fa whose students are in failing schools have other options and people who are in a, a school system that's fairly good but very costly can see cost reductions and save taxpayers money. I think that's a very uh, rational policy that's, tri that's been tried around the world to great success and in other states. One of the things that I'd like to see, though, is to make sure that our regulation uh, does not, does not uh, snuff out the private school market or cartelize it and do to public schools, do to the private schools what it did to public schools and also uh, I would like to, to make sure that homeschoolers still maintain their freedom. Um, school, school choice is such an important issue, and I think it's to the benefit of teachers as well to get them out of the bureaucratic framework. And I, I'm the only candidate who's been talking about this since day one of my campaign, and I've, I'm the only candidate who's, who's calling for the el entire elimination of SOLs. I think they are, the other two candidates are talking about sort of fiddling with SOLs around the edges. I think a competitive marketplace will do a much better job of sussing out quality education rather than these tests, which only, which only test one thing, which is rote memorization. It incentivizes teaching to the test. And I think that's a real problem. You know, you know, we've covered lots of issues, but you probably have more even on your website. You might tell our, tell our viewers the, the web address so they could go there and get more information. Sure, it's www.robertsarvice.com. OK. Well, in our, in our closing 30 seconds or, or so, uh, if you'd like, look into the camera and, and tell viewers why they should vote for you, because some of them may agree with you on many of the issues, but they may be troubled as to whether whether they, their vote is really going to count. That's that's an issue you have to deal with. So tell them why they should vote for Sarvis for governor. Right. Well, first I'll start with a with a quote from I believe it was Ed Koch who said, "Agree with me on nine out of twelve issues, vote for me. Agree with agree with me twelve out of twelve, see a shrink." I'm not claiming that you need to agree with me on every issue, but the principal value 
that is lost in the Republican and Democratic parties is the rule of law and freedom. And if you're upset with the way that our politics is going in the local, federal, and state levels, the best thing to do is reject the Republicans and Democrats and vote principally, for vote as a matter of principle for a candidate who is focusing both on economic freedom and on personal liberty. So we're, we'll have to stop it right okay. there, but th thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond, and we encourage the viewers to check out the website. Thank you very much. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at VirginiaRodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.